Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the Lung Health Foundation's Youth Vaping and Cannabis Use Webinar Series. Today has been made possible by the Catholic District School Board of Eastern Ontario, and it's open to all parents, educators, and other caring adults who work with youth. The Lung Health Foundation's goal with all of our smoking and vaping programming is to make sure future generations don't suffer the debilitating effects of lung disease. We're very proud to be doing this work with you here today. We're gonna to be getting started soon, um, but first, of course, there's always announcements at the beginning here. So we wanna give you a couple of details that are gonna make sure you get the most of today's program. We've dedicated time for questions and answers at the end, but if you do have questions throughout the presentation, you can type it in the Q&A box, chat box at any time. We have a chat moderator there um, who's monitoring. You can upvote any questions. So if you see one that you like, you can um, vote on it and then that brings it up to the top. You may come away with this from the session with more questions about vaping uh, and cannabis or even other respiratory issues. We are always here to help as the Lung Health Foundation. We have a free lung health line that is staffed by certified respiratory educators. Sharon is putting the uh, contact information in the chat box now. So at any point in time, you can give them a call for more support. Tomorrow morning, we're going to email you a list of resources, a PDF, including some that are unique to your community in Eastern Ontario. We'll also give you a sneak peek of our Quash program, a unique app for youth who are looking to quit smoking or vaping, uh, and it's launching next week. So it's an exciting time for us. So now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to Be in the Know, Talk It Out, Take Action. This talk is presented by um, our colleague, Heather McCulley, who's a noted leader in health promotion, tobacco control, and youth engagement. Um, she holds a master's degree in public health and an honors bachelor's of kinesiology. She's a part-time professor at Mohawk College in the health, wellness, and fitness program, and is a senior reviewer for the Journal of Youth Engagement and Health Promotion. So with that, Heather, I will turn things over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Joss, for that intro. Just going to get uh, my slides up for everybody and then we will get started. Okay. All right, so this is exciting. I'm really excited about uh, tonight's participation in this webinar um, for being the No Talk It Out Take Action. Um, we're gonna be talking about youth vaping and cannabis youth, which is an exciting topic for me. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a break from kind of COVID talking. So it's, it's really kind of interesting to explore some of the other stuff that's going on right now um, in the world and for young people. Uh, so thanks for that intro again, Jess. Um, I do usually start um, with on top, the most important thing I leave out of my um, bio for some reason, uh, in addition to being an educator, um, like most of you, I'm, I'm a parent. Um, and that's what brings you here today because that's that's what it's all about. That's what we're all here for. Um, so these are my two kids. I thought I'd, I'd share them a little bit, a little brag post. Um, and again, just to, so you know that I'm, I'm with you on wanting to protect our kids. Um, and anything we talk about today is nothing that I wouldn't do or say um, to my two kids here. Violet is a little ginger spice you see there. Um, and Brody is my extreme, um, extreme sporter, uh, which we, we're going to talk about later too, about um, healthy, healthy highs and healthy risks. Uh, so I wanted to start with that. Uh, the other things that we're going to talk about today, in addition to my kids, uh, our agenda for today, I'm going to go over a few principles and terms because language in the field of vaping and cannabis can get very confusing. Um, some things can mean um, different things to different people. So I want to set some uh, terminology so we are all on the same page before we move forward. Uh, I'm going to go through some myths and facts and key messages, um, tips for talking with youth about uh, vaping and cannabis, and then some take action, which are those programs and resources and other supports that just talked about that uh, will also be sent in follow up. And then we'll do the Q&A. Uh, this isn't going to go entirely like linear the way it's laid out here. I have um, some of the talk it out tips woven in with some of the myths and facts. So it's hopefully going to be a natural flow for all of you um, so that the topic we're talking about leads right into what you can do and how you can apply the information. Uh, it's going to be a lot of me talking, but I've tried to um, make it some storytelling, uh, some videos, we're going to do some polls, um, and some other surprises too throughout the presentation. So here are some of those terms and some philosophies that I like to share before my presentations. A, it gets you to know a little bit about me and how I approach my work 
uh, with young people and how I approach um, my uh, relationships with my kids even too. Uh, so there are 11 principles of youth engagement. I've kind of put my top three up here, just so the ones that I feel are the most important um, as we go through and we work with, work with or um, care for young people. So the positive youth development principle is really a shift. Um, and same with strengths-based approach. We're shifting away from uh, a deficit model of working with young people, which has been ingrained throughout history, um, largely in our youth, in our justice system, um, post-war times. We really, uh, up until now, have really focused on young people as, as problems that need to be dealt with or need to be treated or need to be fixed or we need to fix this problem. Um, to really shift to more positive youth development and looking at young people as resources that need to be developed as opposed to problems to be managed. A strengths-based approach is going to be a theme throughout this whole presentation. Um, so that's really a commitment to working with, with youth to identify their needs and build on their assets. So skill building, knowledge building, um, ongoing feedback, self-reflection. So really focusing on what are their strengths and not necessarily what is the problem that needs to be solved. And my number one principle uh, is flexibility and innovation. So our world is changing, young people is change, are changing, Very, their world changes very, very fast. Um, so we as adults working with young people have to be flexible in our strategies and in our practices and in our approaches with young people. And we have to be open to innovation, trying something new, trying a new approach, something that you might have never done before um, because the same is not going to get us anything different um, with young people and that's why we're kind of hitting um, a bit of a plateau with some of uh, behavior specifically substance use where we would like to kind of push past and it's going to require uh, some innovative strategies um, and that one big point about flexibility is being flexible to hear young people's ideas for how to solve the problem too so we're not training you here today and talking about all this so we become the experts in vaping and, and cannabis use it's so that we come closer to where their knowledge, frankly, because they're very knowledgeable on these topics. Um, and we that and we're open enough to hear what they have to say, what they know, um, and their ideas for how uh, to, to solve the problems. So some vaping terms so that we can, again, get all on the same page with terminology just very quickly. So vaping is inhaling and exhaling an aerosol containing nicotine and flavoring. Um, in every most cases, 90 something percent of young people that use are vaping nicotine and they're also vaping flavors. So unless otherwise specified, I'm going to be referring to vapes that contain nicotine um, and same with flavors. And it, unless otherwise specified, there's usually the formula is nicotine, a flavoring, and then some sort of carrier to carry that nicotine. And we'll get a little, dig a little deeper in that. Um, I use the term vapes. Some people uh, use vaping products. Um, some people use e-cigarettes, which is kind of a bit of an outdated term now. Um, so when I say vapes, I'm talking about really any vaping product out there, whether you call it jewels, stealths, a vape pen, a tank, a mod, um, a disposable, an e-cigarette, an e-juice. It's kind of that umbrella term for all vaping products. And nicotine, similarly to uh, tobacco products, is the addictive chemical found um, in the tobacco plant or produced synthetically um, and has certain pharmacological and psychodynamic uh, effects, which we will continue to refer to. Nicotine is going to be the big um, ingredient going forward. Cannabis terms, and again, the vaping in the cannabis is going to be woven in throughout the presentation. I'm not gonna do just all vaping and all cannabis. They're, they're very intertwined um, because you can vape cannabis. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to intertwine uh, the topic. So I wanted to get the terms out out front. Uh, so cannabis in general, and I use cannabis is that's the correct uh, terminology to use. That's the correct name for the plant as opposed to marijuana, weed, um, all the other kind of slang terms. Uh, so cannabis is a group of three plants um, that have psychoactive or psychoactive meaning mind altering properties. So when those flower tops or the other parts of the plants are harvested and they're dried that's what we that's what we now commonly know as as to be cannabis the stuff that we buy that dried buds those dried harvested flowers recreational cannabis is what we're going to be talking about today so uh, out of scope for today's presentation is is um, really medicinal cannabis or any um, medicinal uses of cannabis we're going to be focusing on the use of cannabis for personal enjoyment 
rather than something provided to manage medical conditions. Um, specifically because the research in young people for medicinal cannabis is limited um, and not very uh, solid. We don't have a lot of it and it doesn't uh, tell us um, anything sound yet. We need to know more uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the last two acronyms for some very large chemical words, uh, THC or tetrahydrocannabinol is the main ingredient in cannabis. That's the ingredient that gives people that high, um, that, that those psychoactive mind, psychoactive mind altering responses. Um, and it can get into our system a variety of ways, smoking, vaping, using edibles, uh, oils, capsules, the long list of uh, ways that uh, THC can get into our system. Um, and cannabidiol, CBD, is also a psychoactive component. It's just not, doesn't act the same way as THC. So CBD tends to be weaker. It doesn't bind to receptors, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, as strongly as THC, or it needs to pair itself with THC to bind. Uh, so because it needs so much help to have its effect, uh, the, if the effects aren't as strong as THC. Okay, so here we're going to get into some of the, the, the fun parts about um, myths and facts around cannabis. So you're taking this webinar, which is the very first step to how to approach vaping and uh, cannabis use with young people. You're getting yourself up to speed on the facts and the knowledge about uh, these substances. So we can only address it with young people if we are informed ourselves and we have the correct uh, scientific information. So kudos to all of you for for joining to get yourself uh, up to speed on this information and getting um, the facts to be able to have those conversations. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to um, we're going to have some poll questions. The poll's going to the question's going to be on the screen and a poll function is going to pop up with like a myth fact true false option. Um, everybody can respond. You just click on your screen based on your response. Uh, there's no judgment. It's completely anonymous. It just gives us um, some interaction for the presentation and gives us a jumping off point to talk about um, the, the question and the, and the myth or the fact. So our first um, statement or question is, question, vaping is a healthy replacement for smoking. And our poll question is going to pop up. So myth or fact, vaping is a healthy replacement for smoking. Everybody can, you click which one you want and then you hit submit. And in a little bit, um, Kate is going to reveal our poll and we can um, go from there and see what everybody thought. And it's okay if it's, if you don't know, and it's okay if it's not the right answer. That's what we're all here for, to really get the, the right answer. Okay, so we have 97% of people saying that it's a myth and, and a small percentage um, saying it's fact. It is a healthy replacement um, for smoking. Now the questions, uh, thanks for Kate, I'll close that poll now. So this is common myth for people. And again, the language that the industry has put out there about around vaping has kind of tripped people up on really understanding if this is in fact um, fact. So. Vaping is a, a, not a healthy replacement for smoking. Um, is it healthier than smoking? Maybe. Does it have less chemicals? Yes. Um, but is it a healthy replacement for smoking, especially for young people? Uh, no, it's, it's not. The difference with vape from vaping um, to smoking, the main difference is that it doesn't contain tobacco. Um, and the biggest harms from cigarettes come from when we burn or combust tobacco. And that's how we, where we get all those carcinogens. Uh, and it, there's lots of other chemicals in addition to tobacco, but when we heat something at high heat or, or burn it or combust it, that's when the chemicals change their properties, become carcinogenic and become really, really problematic. So we know we have data that shows there's an association between vaping and acute and chronic lung disease. Uh, so we know that vaping is causing health harms. Um, and again, it's not just the tobacco that we are concerned about. There's tons of other chemicals uh, in vaping products. And we're going to talk about those uh, a little bit further when we get into flavoring, um, where that become problematic for people. So both the products cause harm, but just in kind of different ways. Tobacco harms uh, from smoking cigarettes tend to, especially for young people, they think that's not going to happen to them. It tends to happen way later in life, long term. That's a 
quote unquote, the young people would say in old person's um, illnesses. Whereas vaping, uh, we have, we've started to see more short-term acute um, effects on the respiratory health in young people. Um, so that whole aspect of having acute lung disease is, is kind of different with vaping and something that um, healthcare providers and parents and teachers want to be uh, concerned about. Uh, and we can talk about that further. So vapes, although they have less chemicals than tobacco and, and cigarette smokes, they, they are still harmful and, and they are not safe, especially for young people, uh, which we're gonna talk about further. There's really no uh, safe level of use uh, in young people for vaping. So part of the reason that this myth or this misperception exists is because people in general and young people think that vaping is just vapor. It's just water vapor, right? So how could it be harmful? And this language about around vapes, just sheer calling them vapes, is giving the industry a leg up on the perception that these are these products are healthy and safe. So a little bit of, we're going to have quite a bit of, of chemistry 101 tonight. So taking you back to kind of grade 11 chemistry, what is a gas or maybe earlier, I can't even remember when I learned this stuff. So the difference between a gas, a vapor and an aerosol, this is what it comes down to. So a gas is something that spreads, mixes in the air and it will go and grow and grow um, until it's fully mixed into the air. A vapor can mean the same thing. So uh, it can mix into the air. It's something we visibly exhale steam, it can be steam or fog. So something along the line that it's a, like a wet um, water-based vapor, steam or fog is water-based. Whereas an aerosol, which is what vapes actually are, is a mixture of liquid particles suspended in the gas. So if you have any sort of particles, which there are lots of in vapes, uh, it then becomes an aerosol. And the difference between an aerosol, which we're going to address further, is that it leaves those particles and it leaves drops behind. So think about that happening in your lungs. You have an aerosol that's carrying particles and it's leaving those particles and dropping them into your lungs. Whereas vapor it is not, it's, it's water, it's going away, it's, it's mixing into the air um, and it's not leaving anything behind. So this is a big misperception is that vapes are are vapor and they're not even actually vape, vapor at all. So that's the biggest misperception. Um, and the language, again, we talked about the importance of language is, is really working for the industry and in, in calling them vapes on their own, people get that perception that it's just like water vapor. So it's an aerosol, not a vapor. The difference being um, on the left here, hairspray is an aerosol. Think about hairspray and I do an experiment when I go into classes. Um, with kids, I even have the tools here, but I won't do it. It's not going to have the same effect on Zoom. When you spray hairspray, if you were to spray hairspray on your arm, think about what that would feel like, what that would smell like. Think about those senses. A, hairspray smells strongly. Uh, B, it's sticky. When you spray that on your arm, it's leaving something behind. It is sticky and it's, it, you're going to have to really work to wash that away. Versus a vapor is like, my son has a gecko, my 11 year old son, I told you about earlier, we have a pet gecko and we have to mist him, right? To help him shed his skin. That's vapor, that's water vapor. It's if you sprayed that on your arm, you're wiping it off, nothing is left behind. Um, and it's easily, it's easily washed away and it doesn't smell, right? So although they're both clear and they look the same in the air, they're not, they're not the same at all. And that's really the crux of understanding the safety um, of vaping products is really understanding what it chemically is. Okay, Next, and like um, Jess said before, we're gonna go through these myths. And if you think of questions as we go through, pop them in the chat or write them down for the Q&A section. If you wanna go back to that myth and we can dig deeper into it, into the Q&A, um, we, we will, we'll go back to that. Okay, next question. So I'm kind of going in between vaping and cannabis. The majority of youth don't use cannabis. So poll question, the majority of youth don't use cannabis. Hopefully you've had a chance to respond, myth or fact. 
Okay, 50-50, this is interesting. So 50, right straight down the middle. 50% um, of people think the majority of youth don't use and 50% of people think uh, the majority of youth are using cannabis. Um, and when I say majority, I'm saying anything above 50%. So this is going to be some interesting information for people then as um, if that is um, some of the perceptions and the knowledge out there. So we're going to go through it. Okay. Sorry, my slides are, there we go. My button is sticking to the next button. Okay. So I've given you, so this is some statistics from, and so this, it's only a little bit of statistics, just I don't try to bog people down with statistics and numbers, um, and nor do I think you have to memorize them or, or be totally aware of them. I'm just trying to give you the sense of the landscape and how these numbers affect our messaging and our interactions with young people. So our past year drug use, according to uh, the Ontario Student Drug Use and Health Survey or the OSTIS, um, so these are some of the, the numbers there. So I wanted to give you kind of the list of where vaping and cannabis fall um, with, within the, the top drugs being used. So we have alcohol at the top. Hopefully that's not a surprise to people. Sadly, it's still up there um, as the top drug being used by uh, students in grades seven to 12. I will also flag that this is a student um, drug use and health survey. So it is only, uh, it's a huge sample and it's been a long standing survey um, in our Ontario schools, but it doesn't represent um, young people who are out of school. So I do want to flag that. So alcohol at the top, high caffeine energy drinks, that's a whole other story and a whole other webinar altogether, are number two. Um, and vapes are sitting at number three and cannabis four. Um, so both of these are above opioids and tobacco now. So you can see the numbers are, are not in the majority at all. So vaping, 22.7% um, of youth only reported vaping and slightly lower than that, only 22% um, reported using cannabis in the past year. So the majority of youth aren't vaping. And this is our opportunity to shift um, that message and flip the script and shift the statistics to a more of a strengths-based approach and a strengths-based message. And these have all um, been changed. Mostly all of these um, have been going down. So alcohol at 41.7 is down um, from the last time it was surveyed. Energy drinks down. The, really the only areas that were up are vaping. No surprise. We're up 12% since last year um, with the youth of use of vapes um, for young people. So that's concerning. So no, the majority aren't using but we've seen a huge spike in use. So that's when people in public health start to pay attention. Um, and that's what we actually call an epidemic. If you've seen um, the headlines about the vaping epidemic, anytime we see a spike in cases, a rapid spike is what when we call um, an epidemic. So vaping, yeah, massive spike doubled um, in the last year. Cannabis, however, has gone down. Even since legalization, we've seen um, an overall decrease uh, in cannabis, 3% since 2017. So that's an interesting, interesting trend to keep um, pay attention to. The story really becomes when we get into edibles and vaping. So edibles and vaping of cannabis have both gone up. So overall cannabis use has gone down, but we're seeing again, vaping of cannabis going up and edibles going up. And we're gonna kind of talk about why. Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, young people's knowledge that were is improving, um, but also the discreteness of vaping and edibles, right? There, you don't see a smoke. Um, you can do it more discreetly, um, which is capitalizes on young people uh, where they're at in their stage of development. Opioids in young people going down uh, and tobacco smoke uh, going down as well, which is a great sign because that's really um, where the biggest burden of disease is. Uh, and we're going to come back to some of these too, because the, the other kind of concern that will be woven throughout this presentation is those vaping numbers can lead into the tobacco smoke numbers. And then we could start to see um, that tobacco numbers go up as the vaping numbers go up over time. So something we want to pay attention to. As far as problem, what we call problematic use, like where it gets to be a problem, where we get to see dependence at daily use, someone who's kind of really, really heavily addicted. Uh, vaping, daily use of vaping 
same deal, gone up 11% concern. So we, we're seeing youth not only vape, but vaping often every day, multiple sessions a day and multiple puffs a session. Uh, cannabis, problematic use uh, in young people, 2% in grade seven to 11, 5% in grade 12. And all of these numbers that I'm showing you on both the last two slides go up uh, as the grade level goes up. So in grade seven, the numbers are smaller and all those numbers are going up as we get to grade 12. So the numbers of young people who are cannabis dependent based on um, the, the severity of cannabis use scale are small. But again, doesn't mean that that's not concerning because that is the time between 14 and 20 where a, a person can become, is the, at most risk or at most vulnerable to becoming dependent on cannabis. So we don't want really any percentage because we want to protect all young people. Um, and those small groups of people, which still represent a lot of students, um, are in a really, really vulnerable age uh, for getting dependent on cannabis. And this is another interesting just, uh, stat I thought I'd share with you. Abstinence. So not using any drugs, reported use of no drugs at all is 42% of young people. So again, a, a good amount of young people are not using any drugs. And that abstinence rate is up. And same deal though, that abstinence rate goes down as we get to that grade level. So it really highlights the importance of talking to young people early, talking often and intervening before we see that um, scale go up. So these statistics, these numbers give us an in, they give us an opportunity to flip the script. Okay, and here's an example of that. So. On the OSTIS data, when you look at their graphs, it's again, it's all about the, the big, the, the numbers, right? One in five Ontario students use uh, used cannabis this past year, okay? So that's 22% used. So we wanna focus on those people that are using, or we could flip it, make a strengths-based message. This is just an example, but you can use this in um, any of your conversations with young people. So instead of one in five are using, four out of five are not using. Right. So, you know, four to five students, a big majority have not used cannabis in the past year. Great idea. Great message. Big challenge with this big challenge with this making young people believe the message. These are two um, ads from a recent uh, vaping and cannabis prevention campaign we've done here in the city of Hamilton. And I use them as this example because we did exactly this. We flipped the script. We flipped the message. So if you don't use cannabis, you're part of the pack. You know, you're part of the group. Uh, four out of five have reported not using. And then same with the vaping message. Despite common belief, most youth don't vape. When we tested these message, both of these, the trouble, they rated the lowest. And it was because the young people did not believe it. They just didn't believe it. Because it's not what they're seeing in their immediate peer crowd. It's not what they're seeing in the media. It's not what they're seeing online and social media. Their perceptions um, have been built to think more people are using than actually do. And we're gonna talk about how to address that. Okay, next poll. So vapes without nicotine must be safe then. Okay, we know uh, nicotine, it's dangerous. Take that away, must be safe. So it's coming up with myth and fact again. Take a minute to record your response and hit submit. Okay, so a little bit of a split here. So 73% are saying that this is a myth. So vapes without nicotine um, are not safe and some 7% believe that though that's fact. Interesting. So we're gonna talk about um, what's in vapes aside from nicotine. So what makes up a vape, either an e-juice or a pod, is typically nicotine in most of them, a flavoring of some sort, propylene glycol, and vegetable glycerin, which are um, in there to carry, help carry the nicotine um, and help the absorption of nicotine. So take out the nicotine. Um, you don't necessarily need the, the, the carriers after you take out the nicotine. So you're largely left with flavors. So what could be wrong with that? 
So there, there's about 7,000 flavors on the vape market right now. And most of them are uh, kid friendly, gummy bear, cotton candy, all kinds. If, especially if you go online, like you can see the US market flavors. That's like some of the images here, creme brulee. It, it, it's really endless. Some of those flavors can be specifically can be problematic. The problem is a lot of these flavorings were safe and deemed safe to, to ingest, right? To eat, to consume which is fine. Our digestive system has the ability, it has the function, it has um, the, the mechanics to break this down. Our respiratory system, however, does not. So although these flavorings have been deemed safe for ingestion, they're not safe for inhalation um, and they can cause quite a few problems. Specifically, there's some really good studies um, on flavors like cinnamon, menthol, uh, cherry, and any form of like a butter flavor, like a dicetel butter flavor. Those particular flavors, we've seen um, some interesting studies of them affecting the endothelial cells, which are your cells that um, line your blood vessels. So if the cells that line your blood vessels um, are, are being harmed, that's going to show cardiovascular and, central, and um, vascular effects in your body. So that's pretty concerning. So the flavors on their own, inhaling them in the respiratory system are problematic. The other issue with flavors um, is, is sugar. So sugar sounds great. And the reason why we have these flavors is because if you um, took in nicotine on its own, or even just some of the carrier um, properties, it, it doesn't taste very good. It's, it's very harsh and it, it's not meant to taste good. So a lot of these flavors are to help us consume the nicotine as well as making it uh, appealing for young people. And the sugar actually has an added benefit. Um, so some great studies uh, God, years ago out of uh, the, the Phyllis Moore lab on its own were studying how to make nicotine stronger um, for, for cigarettes. And what they found was they isolated the a compound called acetyl aldehyde, which comes from burning sugar. And when you burn or heat sugar at high heats, which both smoking and vaping will do, you get acetyl aldehyde. And acetyl aldehyde bonus helps absorb nicotine and carry nicotine to the brain. In addition, it has some mood enhancing properties as well. So the industry doesn't just put these in here to make it taste good. There's a lot of background chemistry helping where the flavors are helping them addict people harder and faster. Um, in this province, PEI actually just banned all flavors from vape products. In this province, we only ban um, flavors to be sold to licensed vape specialty shops. So it's somewhat of a flavor ban. You can't get them in um, convenience stores and corner stores now, um, but they're still very easily accessible online um, or again through friends that go that can go in the shop. So the bottom line message from these last two kind of myths that we've talked about, and these, these are kind of messages that you want to stick with, um, reinforce, consistently say those. The bottom line is vaping and cannabis use is not harmful, and most students are not doing it. Or, sorry, it's not harmless, sorry, I should say, and most students are, are not doing it. And the second one is the only thing that should go into our lungs is air. So those are hopefully some simplified messages that we can kind of stick with, repeat, repeat, and consistently apply. The believability is harder, but the more that we get at it, uh, the more they're going to believe it. Okay, another poll. Um, using cannabis helps students manage stress and anxiety. Poll will go up. Using cannabis can help students manage stress and anxiety. Okay, so myth. Uh, so we're getting a little closer on this one. So the myth um, is sixty-five percent, fact thirty-five percent. So most people think that uh, you, this is a myth. Using cannabis um, does not help students manage stress, stress and anxiety, and that would be uh, the the right answer. That would be the truth. So there's the evidence on um, for medicinal cannabis for anxiety in young people is just not there. And what is there is largely anecdotal. Um, so we don't have a lot of evidence to show that can, medicinal cannabis will help 
young people with things like anxiety and depression. So the link between cannabis and anxiety and depression, we just don't have. Um, so that's unfortunate because young people do hear a lot of the messages from the adult context where we do have a little bit more research and they assume that that applies to them around managing anxiety. The link we do know very strongly for um, cannabis youth and young people is the connection to early psychosis. Uh, and I'm not gonna get to, into much depth about that because I'm not um, a psychiatrist, but just know that uh, there is a strong link between cannabis use, the earlier you use um, and early psychosis, especially in someone who's already vulnerable um, to psychosis and mental health disorders. So someone who has a family history, um, someone who's already experiencing mental health, so some key messages when addressing um, cannabis use, mental health, psychosis is know your family history as well as your own history. Really, everybody should try to delay as long as possible, especially those with existing or a history of mental health conditions. Uh, those who are genetically vulnerable should abstain from cannabis use, right? Um, if you have already experienced psychosis, Right. If you if you have a bad reaction, you feel too high and you're already experiencing psychosis, try to remain calm, get to a safe place, eat something and go with someone that you feel comfortable with. So that's kind of more of that harm reduction message. If this does happen to you, uh, this psychosis, here's what to do. So there's two little bits of messages to go along with that. I'm sorry, I don't know why my slides are not clicking. Okay, the bigger concern for mental health professionals um, outside of um, mental health disorders per se is the effect of drug use, cannabis or nicotine, uh, but we're specifically talking about cannabis here um, on the developing brain. So lots of data and lots of research on this. So this slide is showing you uh, the prefrontal cortex part of the brain. And that part of the brain is largely responsible uh, it, as far as from mental health conditions, concerns, it's personality and moderating social behavior. In addition to focusing, um, attention, organizing, all of those kind of, uh, those kind of functions in the prefrontal cortex. The thing with this part of the brain is it's the last part to mature. It doesn't mature till well into our 20s. So those parts of it are very vulnerable until then. And they're constantly, constantly developing. In the prefrontal cortex, as well as throughout the rest of the body, we have a system called the endocannabinoid system. Okay, so it's a system in our body uh, where that's where the cannabis receptors function. I'm not going to get into too much depth in that today, um, but just know that that endocannabinoid system is important in brain development as well as adolescent development overall, because that system is responsible for stress response and emotional control too. So they all kind of work together, right? So the parts of the brain, the endocannabinoid system, um, all work together. And that's where we can see some of these mental health symptoms or experiences is the effect of cannabis on that immature part of the brain, as well as the interaction in the endocannabinoid system. In addition to the brain um, prefrontal cortex development, at the same time, we also have what's called um, pruning and myelination happening in the, the teen brain or the adolescent brain. Pruning means they're, it's kind of like a, the use it or lose it concept, okay? We're getting rid of those connections that we don't need and growing the ones that we do and making the ones that we do more efficient, okay? So you can see what happens is uh, in early adolescence, we have lots of lots of connections. And after we prune in late adolescence, we only have the ones that we use left. And those ones that we use are efficient and we get better at things and we learn as we go on. Drug use and cannabis use in particular can affect, it, it helps this, um, the endocannabinoid system helps this process, but THC can bind to some of those receptors and mess this process up and make it less efficient. So that's when you see, start to see things like uh, reaction time change because we have those receptors all through the body. And so we talk a lot about driving um, and our change in our reaction time. And this is exactly what's happening, right? We have those receptors through our body, they're, they're getting all messed up. The messages are getting messed up and less efficient and they can be problematic. Last slide on this, and this is kind of for your own knowledge. This is a really um, enlarged 
image of um, a, like a cell and neuron where the message is passing from the presynoptic neuron uh, to the postsynoptic neuron. And normally neurotransmitters travel across and they pass a message uh, like dopamine um, passes a message to relax, feel good, all those kind of things. When you're talking about nicotine, nicotine would cross, would pass across and nicotine receptors would give a signal on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, to same deal, feel good, it, it trigger the dopamine receptors, do whatever. In the instance of THC, what happens is that so the cannabinoid system is a little different in that those receptors work backwards. So THC acts on the cell and instead of triggering the message in the postsynaptic cell, it goes backwards and gives the message to the presynaptic cell, which obviously messes up the signal and can mess up the message. Or we usually use the term, it can dim the message or, or a dimmer message making, again, think of that reaction time. It's not as quick, it's not as efficient because of the way those receptors act on the cell. So these are really the big kind of mental health neurological uh, concerns that people would be concerned about. This is a video about vaping and mental health. About, up until now, we've talked about uh, cannabis and mental health. This one is about vaping um, and it comes from the, a youth perspective. So I'm gonna let you take a look at that. Sorry, Heather, we're not able to actually hear the video. Oh, I can so, hear it. Yeah, I think maybe what we could do, could, maybe we could put the link in the chat yeah. and send it out. Yeah, Brooke, thank you. Um, you can share your sound from the Zoom controls. It's just a little finicky piece. Oh, yes. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Do you know, do you know where to do that? Yeah, I got it right here. Okay, cool. Thank you, Brooke. No. Old and I started vaping in July. I'm Caitlin. I started vaping three years ago. My name's Isaac, and I started vaping at 17. I'm Chloe. I'm 17, and I started vaping when I was 15. As soon as I started vaping, like, I started having panic attacks. I thought it just affected your body and not your mindset. It was making me feel less than who I was. My confidence was just dropping. I thought vaping could be a stress reliever because most of my friends were doing it and they were telling me how it helped them through school and homework. And I was trying to make a decision of where I wanted to play college football at. And I was just extremely stressed, so I picked it up and tried it. Vaping does not make you relaxed. If anything, it makes it so that you are more anxious. At first, I didn't think it was like addictive. I thought I was kind of stronger than it, but soon I realized like it was holding kind of a power over me. Like I would leave class and use it and I was always craving more and more. Like it was never enough. A lot of people assumed I was happy all the time, but once I got home, I would go to my room and it'd just be depression and sadness and loneliness and I felt like no one was there for me. Well, I started isolating myself from a lot of people, friends, family, and the world. My anxiety got really bad after I started vaping. It wouldn't even have to do with vaping. It would just be like about anything really. And it was odd because I was never an anxious person before. I realized what vaping really did to me. It was not helping me cope. It was canceling out my ability to cope. I started to feel anxious and it wasn't happening to anybody else. So that meant that something was wrong with me. That just made me feel even more anxious and even more sad. It made my anxiety so bad. I couldn't even leave the house. I was scared to go to school. And then once I stopped, everything got better. I started a club at my school with my friend Tommy. We decided that other people needed a support group to like know that they're backed when they wanted to quit. You don't have to keep doing it if it's not something that you really want to be doing. I'm someone that has done it. And so I kind of want to be that voice for the like generation coming up to make sure they don't make the same mistakes. Hi, it's Caitlin. Hey, guys. 
So just going back. So great video from the youth perspective and they're when they've gotten a chance to kind of reflect on their experience with vaping. So the industry would lead us to believe that vaping, even smoking, um, helps you relax. That's a big myth out there, right? Uh, there's some great studies around the connection between vaping um, and depression and anxiety. So uh, what we know is vapors are two times more likely to experience anxiety, depression, and other emotional problems. And the one girl in the video talked about it. Um, she explained it really good where she thought she was, she felt anxious. And a lot of that is you get the brain gets something it's used to nicotine in particular in this case. Um, and it calms down for a short time. Um, and you believe that's what's lessening your stress and that's what's calming you. But then quickly you start to, it starts to drop and you start to get those withdrawal symptoms, which are very similar to anxiety. So you think you have to use again to calm yourself down. And that whole cycle starts again. And the anxiety, the root cause never, ever is addressed. And the whole reason you started using in the first place is never addressed. So when we talk about vaping and cannabis use and mental health, here's the tips um, for addressing that and talking it out, getting to that root cause. Uh, why are they vaping? Why are they using cannabis? There's a reason. And those young people who cite stress as a reason, um, we, you want to kind of ask those questions to find out what is that stress? What does it look like? What is it causing? Some of these reasons are very complex and, and not easily addressed uh, in, in one instance, uh, but some of it there are solutions to. Talking about legal versus safe and this perception of safety, um, they think something's legal, uh, cannabis in particular, that it's therefore safe. Um, and really looking at some of those, our permissive attitudes towards these drugs and how that's affecting uh, young people thinking that that's going to help them um, and help their stress and help their mental health. Share what you learned about the developing brain. Share your concern for the developing brain. We, we kind of always go at the lungs, the lungs, um, the heart, those kind of common um, uh, risk factors, which we still need to address, but we don't always talk about, you know, your brain's growing. Uh, and I'm concerned that it's going to affect the things that you want to do in your life. Help them find other ways to chill. Again, here's where you can start to apply some of those youth engagement principles, ask them for their ideas, help them build their rat park, which I'll talk about in one second, that those natural highs. Most young people started socially. It was a social source. So socially is going to be the solution. How do we help them connect? How did, is there people that they can um, be around? Can they quit together if they're already using it? What's that social solution? And um, when, when it gets too complex and when it gets too hard, tag out, tap out and consult a healthcare provider. Now, helping them build their rat park, and I want to touch on this before we get on. So there is a great, great study uh, by researcher Bruce Alexander, if you're not already familiar with it, where he studied uh, heroin overdosing. And he studied this in rats, like most animal studies, and had isolated rats in a cage with a water bottle and a heroin bottle. And obviously, in most instances, the rats OD'd on heroin. So Bruce Alexander said, well, obviously, they're ODing on heroin. They have nothing else to do in this cage. So he repeated the study with rats in a bigger cage. They had toys. They had other rat friends in there with stuff to do. And not surprisingly, the rats didn't even care about the heroin. They didn't even use it. So this is kind of the model we want to build for our young people. What's their rat park? What is in their rat park that's going to help them avoid the, the stimulus or help them avoid the drug? Is it people? Is it a passion? Is it a hobby? Is it uh, resolving stress or resolving trauma? What, what needs to be in their rat park and how can we help them build it? These are some resources. There's tons, I, I realize, re, uh, resources just in your area in Eastern Ontario locally um, for addressing youth mental health and how um, uh, addictions and substances are woven in through that. And these are all going to be included going forward. And obviously Kids Help Phone. Someone is always there at Kids Help Phone. And that's really a big message that we need to be reinforcing that you, you aren't alone. Someone's always on the other end. I'm going to jump ahead uh, because Sorry to jump ahead. This will get addressed uh, as we go forward because I don't want to cut into your question time. And I do want to leave you with some key messages about engaging and discussing and talking with young people about cannabis here to start off when we talk about cannabis and vaping with young people, we need to take a minute and reflect back to when we were young and reflect back to what it was like when we were young. And if you're like me, this is what it was like uh, when you were young, and it's slightly different uh, from now. Do you like the shade? 
Sure, I use it all the time. They jump a little bit forward so you can <laughs> get for the, your lips. the just of the video. the bod on that new math teacher, Mr. Lucas. What a babe. It was the first time I've ever stayed awake in algebra. <laughs> uh, I better not. How come? I I'm trying to quit. <laughs> you should have seen my last chest x-ray. <laughs> Sixth graders are terminally pathetic. Uh-oh, there's the bell. We better get going. Uh-oh. The bell. Uh-oh. Hey, give her a break. She's a good kid. Oh, yeah? So, this... Why don't you go be... Sorry, this might be the way... Oh, my gosh. Apologize. It's not clicking over. That might be the way you remember uh, peer pressure, that direct peer pressure getting cornered, the just say no message, the refusal skills message. Uh, that's just not the way it is anymore. That's that's actually another myth. This is the pressure, right? Uh, the social media pressure, the, the per, creating the perception that more people are using than actually are, okay? The influencers, the sales, the deals. Vape Tricks has 300 million views on TikTok. 300 million people certainly aren't vaping, right? It's this, we're, we're combating some different, really different indirect influences, this creation of culture, creation of community around vaping. And this is what really affects that believability that we talked about earlier, okay? How do they, they can't believe our messages because this is what they're being bombarded with. So we have to kind of reflect and understand that. So here's the really the most, uh, the biggest tip I can give you. So in our work, in, when we worked on Quash to create Quash and a lot of our uh, the research projects that I've been involved in, young people cite one of the reasons for not wanting to quit is because then they would have to tell someone they're using and that I don't want my parent and caregiver uh, or teacher to find out. The industry has capitalized on this, this, this ability, this, this want for them that they want to keep it so discreet. Okay. The industry has made this possible for young people so that they don't have to be public and they don't have to quit. So in fact, actually, I've, you haven't noticed, I've been vaping this whole time here in my basement discreetly and you haven't even noticed, okay? Take a minute, see if you can pick out my vapes. Uh, if you can, I'll show you. So first off, I am wearing my vape hoodie where I've tucked my vape string into the discreet hiding things and it's got my vape adapter on the end of the vaping strings where I can use and adapt to my jewel or really any vape that you have. I also have been charging on my USB, my jewel pod that charges right into my USB on my laptop. And finally, I've been using my vape watch. Awesome vape watch here, right? So my vape uh, comes out of the top of this. Here you go, comes out of the top and I can vape from my vape watch. So thanks to the industry, um, young people, parents and caregivers don't have to find out and teachers don't have to find out. So we really need to understand this. And we need to find a sweet spot in between having no expectations and be, having permissive attitudes about these drugs and creating stigma and fear where they won't want to come to you. And they are too afraid and they're too embarrassed and there's so much stigma that they won't want to seek help behaviors. So we really have to find a sweet spot in between that where we set expectations. I don't want you to vape. I don't want you to use cannabis. And yes, I will be disappointed, but not so much nagging and fear mongering and anger that we make them not want to come to us when they do need help or they do want to quit. Just some last tips and then we will get to questions. Talk early, talk often. I, my 11 year old, we talk all the time about vaping um, and we have for, for some time now. And obviously it's aligned with the curriculum in school at earlier uh, grades. So try to find out from your teachers when they're talking about it. So you can also have those conversations at home. Embrace the awkward. It's going to be awkward, but oh, well, the, the, them learning about the risks from you is the best way for them to get that information, right? Uh, relax, take a step back and just embrace that awkward. It's it, you're still the role model and you have a really important role there. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. This is a big one. I say to adults, right? Check your, make sure you have the right information 
before you wreck yourself and check your own behaviors. Okay. This goes into setting a positive example too. Um, if you use substances, if you use vaping cannabis, try to do it discreetly. Talk about why you use, how you got addicted. How, maybe if you want to quit, uh, don't pretend to be perfect, but recognize that you set that example about permissive attitudes around substances. Know the lingo, know the facts. We talked about that today. Uh, find the right moment and teachable moments. Like I said, when they're learning about it in class, when something's on the news, when there's a Netflix documentary, those are great opportunities uh, to talk openly about uh, vaping and cannabis. Be curious instead of angry. Like, so really use open-ended questions. And this is a technique from the field. You know, not those yes, no questions. Are you vaping? Are you using cannabis? Are your friends using? Those are yes, no questions. You want to use open-ended questions that get them to talk more about their use and about what's happening around them. Be patient, be really patient because your one conversation may not solve the whole thing and it might not go away. Um, you may have to do it over and over and over again. They may not listen to you. They may lash out. So really be patient. Teach, don't preach. It's like I said above, um, you know, share what you know. Uh, but be empathetic, uh, emphatic and empathetic. Appreciate them, acknowledge, get support that you need and let them know we're gonna keep having this conversation. Here's all the great resources. Um, they're at the end. They're going to be in your follow-up slide. There's some great uh, documentaries that you can watch as a family, great resources for adults um, and lots of links from both lung health resources, Health Canada on vaping and cannabis. Um, and actually lots on cannabis and then some addiction services and treatments for when use becomes problematic. And those will all be shared post-session and some for educators. Thanks, Heather. No That's problem. great. Um, and thanks to everyone that uh, have been active in the chat. Um, and so just to reiterate, yes, yeah, so we're going to um, circulate out to you through the email that you use to register the links um, and um and slides so that you have them for reference. One of, we did try to answer, many of you put in questions actually at the time of registration and thank you for that because it did actually help guide us and Heather as she was presenting. Heather, we do have a question and you know, given that we are working so closely with the school boards in Eastern Ontario, I think it's a, it's a really important question. So Kelly had a question around who approaches this population and addresses this ongoing situation. And I, um, you know, I think one of the key things we do want to say, and you'll see this in the resources we provide to you, that each of the schools within your school board, whether you be within um, the, the Catholic District School Board of Eastern Ontario or otherwise, there are mental health um, workers in the schools that are absolutely trained in this area that can put you in touch with the community resources that are that are right close to you, in addition to some of the ones that we're going to provide to like Kids Help Phone, which, um, you know, obviously addresses and provides support across the country. So it is one thing to know that even reaching out to your school um, and the supports that are available through your school is really important because then you have that opportunity to work with your teachers as well as your mental health workers and other supports that might be there and if not then they're another way that you can get some of the support that you may need um but heather i wonder if you want to talk about this sort of more broadly in terms of you know what has been the approach certainly like in ontario around trying to better support youth and those of us that care about the youth um, in the area of cannabis and vaping. Yeah, I mean, the, the main message is that it's really everybody's role. I mean, uh, anyone can be an adult ally and it really is everybody's role to address it, whether it's just those little teachable moment conversations, whether you're doing a lesson in class as an educator or you're a parent having those conversations, um, but also just know more broadly that uh, public health departments and nonprofits all across our province, um, have, and, and like you said, school boards and other community partners um, have been working actively on this vaping issue. We have a, a in public health, we have a vaping mandate uh, to really address some of these key policy measures and advocate for some of these more systems wide change that will help to address some of these perceptions or misperceptions um, and some of the messaging that's allowed out there as well as access issues. Um, in addition, you have it, all schools um, have, in, uh, or school boards have enforcement officers attached to it um, from public health that can be a resource 
um, to both educate and enforce um, the current uh, the current legislation on school property. So there's there are some resources out there, um, depending on how you know, what's the lens you're going to address it from, right? So as a school, you have to kind of think, are we addressing this from, you know, the enforcement lens, the use on school property, the access piece? Are we addressing it as a more of a mental well-being message? So really, what's your approach as a school and what are the resources to support that approach? That's great. Mm -hmm. um, in the interest of time, I am going to bring the session to a close. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, we'll leave the chat open um, for a little bit. And so if there are other questions that you have, please put them in there because what we can do when we send you tomorrow the um, information in terms of all these resources, if there are other questions that we didn't address, then um, we can do our best to, to address them there. You will also get, um, uh, we're going to promote some of the other webinars that we're doing. It's a similar topic. Heather may be part of our faculty in that, but but hearing it again and each presentation is going to be a little bit different um, and the chance to hear from, from different sort of experts or people working in this area is not a bad thing um, or pass it along to your friends, family, neighbors, et cetera, as well, because the more support you have around you um, and having this conversation, you know, the, the better off you'll be. So, Again, on behalf of Lung Health Foundation and the Catholic District School Board of Eastern Ontario, um, I want to thank Heather um, thank for being here with us and thank all of you. Um, stay safe out there and hopefully we'll um, see you uh, again soon. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone.